I think, and I, and I hate to lock myself into a box here, but I really think that we're going to conclude the Building the Church series today. Is that not exciting or what? That's exciting stuff right there. But listen, just because we're closing a series does not mean we're going to quit letting God build his church. Amen? We're going to move on to a new series, but we're going we're to conclude our passage in Ephesians 4, 11 to 16, I believe, today. And as we think about that, and, and you'll see that the title is All Hands on Deck, Part 2. We looked at how Paul's life was transformed from the moment he trusted Christ to the moment he breathed his last, and how God was able to use him, and how willing to be used Paul was. And, and that's important, how willing to be used Paul was. He knew genuinely that he was saved to serve. How many of you believe that you've been saved to serve? Just if you didn't believe it, go and put your hands up because that's the right answer anyhow. You, we have all been saved to serve. And as we keep that in mind, just a question for you. Isn't it amazing sometimes how the smallest thing, the smallest little thing can have the greatest impact in something? Isn't that, it's, it's amazing, whether it's a knee holding you back from your faster pastor race or whether in our case, I got to be a part of a racing team for a number of years, and on a very hot, a very dry, a very sunny, it felt much like this past weekend, July 4th race at the Heston Speedway, my race crew found out the hard way how just one small part can make such a big difference. And on that July 4th race, which was a day race, like I said, hot, dry, the track is slick, uh, we took our limited late model and we were racing against the super lates in their July 4th race. You're like, well, what's the difference between a limited late model and a super late? It's like Pastor Scott racing Pastor Doug. That's what it looks like right there. I might look good just out of the chute and maybe through a tight turn, but it's over after that. And, and so you're a few hundred, well, yeah, that's a, appreciate your vote of confidence there. <laughs> but and maybe after Friday, I'll pose more of a threat to him once we get this knee altered on Friday. But uh, so we're, we're, we take the track, and it was very impressive, actually, to see that my friend drove masterfully, drove masterly, masterfully, and made his way into the feature through his heat race. In fact, he finished well enough. I think he finished second in his heat. There were four heats. There were a lot of cars. We really didn't think we were going to make the show. We were kind of hopeful that with the dry conditions and the smaller motor, we could hook up to the track and keep up with the big guys. Well, the truth is we did. He finished second. We were slated to start eighth in the feature, but you know, this real cool thing is called the pill draw, and they invert the field, and they inverted eight cars, and the 20S found itself on the pole position right beside Scotty Haas, and some of you are like, whoa. Some of you are like, who's Scotty Haas? I'll just tell you, Scotty Haas, as he drove the 33H, was one of the most, one of the most well-known late model drivers in central Pennsylvania history. All that guy does is win everywhere in any car he's in. And I'm like, well, this will be a short-lived uh, pole position. And you know what? That green flag dropped, and that 20S took the lead, and it ducked low. And I'll tell you what, for 10 laps, it set the pace. I could hardly believe it. I'm like, do you see this? We are pulling Scotty Haas on the front stretch. We're pulling him on the back stretch. He's, he's gaining. Like, he is stretching this lead out. I'm like, don't blow it. Don't blow it, Spud Boy. Don't blow it. And all of a sudden, and we were doing really well until it was one of the smallest parts on the car failed. And I'll leave you hang with that for just a second. Yeah, it's, that's good stuff right there. The left hook, it's coming. Actually, that was a right hook, wasn't it? I'm right-handed, so the right hook. As we reread Ephesians 4, 11 to 15, and I want to do that, and if you're not there, you can turn there. The Ephesians 4 passage is really the only one that won't be on the screen. So if you've got your Bible, turn to Ephesians 4, verses 11 to 15. And as, we, as you're turning there, I'll just continue on here. We can clearly see the emphasis that God deliberately places upon the growth of each individual believer. You will see that God deliberately places emphasis on the growth of each individual believer. And that's why you, you may be here with a family of seven today, or you may be here with you, and that's okay, because whether you're here with one or you're here with seven, this message and God's focus is on you today. As much as he is focused on the other six in your family, this is for you today. And really, in your walk with Christ, he is singularly focused on you all the time. God cares about the individual growth of the believer. And as you're going to see, we are each called. 
Listen, it's not an option. You and I, if you've been called to Christ, you're in Christ. You have been called to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. You are called to grow. God is drawing you to himself and longs for you to grow in your understanding and application of his word. And what's he calling us to do? Well, let's, let's just go back to his word and let him tell us. And as Mike shared this morning out of the ESV, shifting gears just a little bit, so it might sound a little different, but it says he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. And so he's given us spiritual leadership. Remember the first message, follow your leaders. Why? To make your life hard. Maybe you think that. To tell you what to do. Maybe you think that. To expound the truth of God's word for you to lead you in the way of understanding, to lovingly continue pointing the body and the bride of Christ's eyes back to Christ. And, and so what does it look like as we follow our leaders? What's their role? What's the purpose? It says in verse 12, for the perfecting or the equipping of the saints. Listen, God's desire through his leadership is to equip you. He deliberately wants to equip you. He wants you to grow. Listen, I don't care when you came to Christ, you've never reached the point where God's like, okay, you've grown enough. Like you've gone, hey, good job. Hey, you've gone far enough. That far. Listen, he wants you to keep going and keep growing and keep walking with him in the truth for the perfecting of the saints. And he says, for this reason, for the work of the ministry. And as you work together in the ministry, it says for the edifying, the building up of the body of Christ until we all come. How many of us? All of us. Every one of you in this room are important. Every one of you in this room matters. If you didn't know that coming in here, God's word makes it clear that each and every one of you matter today. And you might think you're missed by everybody else on this side of glory, but I can tell you there is an eternal God in glory who doesn't miss you this morning. And not only does he see you, he's calling you and he's drawing you and he's yearning to equip you for the work of his ministry. That's what God's word is saying right here. It says, till we all come in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God unto a mature man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. God is literally crafting you and I into the image of his precious Son. His goal is Christ-likeness for you and I. Oftentimes, my goal for my life and my goal for my plans is not what God's goal is for me. Through the good, the bad, the ugly, and the indifferent, God's goal for me in my life is Christ-likeness. And he says that, that, that that's what his goal is for us. That's why he's given us teachers. That's why he's given us his word. That's why he's given his spirit. And it says, as you and I become more like Christ, operating out of the mind of Christ, verse 14, that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro. Like the time of our childhood spiritually, he said, listen, it's been long enough. It's over. The time of getting pushed around back and forth, believing everything that comes down the line, it's over. You're going to draw that line and say, listen, I got fooled before and I got fooled a second. I'm getting fooled no more. I'm going to stand in the truth of God's word. That we be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie in wait to deceive. We're not going to do that. But in verse 15, but speaking the truth in love, in what? Say that again, in what? Love, you and I have been called to speak the truth. Listen, we're really good at wielding the truth. But as we went through this, and actually at two different messages, God has not called you to be a sledgehammer. God's word is a sledgehammer. And when God's word wielded in love, with a, with a spirit of love by the child of God, that sledgehammer will chisel away all that God intends it to when it's wielded in love by the child of God. So speaking the truth in love, listen, we may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. His desire is that we grow up in Christ, from whom the whole body, so from Christ, from whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted or held together by that which every joint supplies. How many of the joints? Everyone, listen, as I'm going into knee surgery on Friday, I can tell you one joint matters. Can I tell you, as you try to, to, try to round first base to head to second in softball, one joint matters, especially when you're planting all your weight on that right one. It matters. And it says that it, this body is held together. It's compacted, knit together, forced together by what, which every joint supplies. Listen, whether you realize it or not, you are a joint in the body of Christ. And you matter today to the health of this local body. 
It says, according to the effectual or effective working in the measure of every part, every part doing its job, makes increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. And so as we, as we look at this, this purpose, as God places the focus, you'll see that there is the individual focus on your growth. But God has focused his sight on you individually because it matters for this whole body what you do. If any one of us walks out of here thinking that what we do doesn't matter in reference to the whole picture of the body of Christ, we are mistaken. Everything that we do as the body of Christ as individuals, it affects the rest of the body, amen? I just encourage you, I wouldn't do it too hard, but take a hammer and smack yourself in the thumb this afternoon. You're like, why would I do that? Yeah, why would we do that? Smack yourself in the thumb and see how much of the rest of your body does not appreciate what you've just done. Oh, you, if you don't want to hit your thumb, you're like, well, I, I got to use that. Smash yourself in the big toe and see how you start jumping around on one foot and how your head, your head, everything, it's all impacted. And so it matters what we do as a body. And so we're going to see three points here this morning. Number one, in reference to all hands on deck, God has called for all hands on deck in the body of Christ. God's called for it. The reason that all hands are on, de- all hands are on deck is because God specifically has called for it. As you look at verse 15 in our scripture, it says, Speaking the truth in love may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. So it says that Christ is the head of this body. And I just want you to know, in this case, it doesn't mean head meaning source. Now, Christ is the source as well. But what this means in the Greek, that that Christ is the head, it means that he's the authoritative leader. What Christ says goes. And so what did Jesus say about us, all hands being on deck? In Matthew 28, 18 to 20. And a lot of this is going to be scripture. We're going to let God's word do the talking. It says, And Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, spoke unto them, meaning the, the the, the 11 disciples who are remaining, It says, he spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you, therefore, and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. Another scripture, Jesus says, As the Father sent me, so send I you. And you can say, well, well, Pastor Scott, that, that that's the disciples. God sent them. That passage is about the disciples. He told them to go. Okay, well, let's shift gears to 2 Timothy 2, 1 and 2. And as Paul is writing his last letter before he's going to be martyred for the gospel of Christ, he writes to young Timothy, and he says, You, therefore, my son, it was his son in the faith, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus, and the things which you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, all that you've heard, all that I've taught you, entrust these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. That's the ministry of multiplication. Paul says to Timothy, everything that I've taught you, everything that you've learned and you've heard and you've seen, I want you to pass that on to others who will do the same. And you'll say, well, Pastor Scott, that's for the elders of the church. He's telling the elders of the church to go and do that. Okay, if you believe that, let's go to Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. Because maybe you're looking for loopholes that, like, that's not for me. Like Cheryl's saying, Lord, anything but that. Like, like that person I've been praying for, like, uh, that, that's, that's their job to talk to them. Or I'll go tell a deacon and they'll talk to him. Or maybe if, maybe Pastor Scott, he's going to be crippled up for a couple of weeks. I mean, he can call him. I'll, I'll get him to call him. And I will do that. But listen to what the Word of God says about us in our service. In Ephesians 2, 8 through 10, it says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. In verse 10, you've heard this now two weeks in a row. I heard it from Nelson, and I've heard it from Pastor Doug. We are his workmanship. What are you? His what? His workmanship. Listen, literally in the Greek, poema. Again, if you don't know, this may be a trivia question someday. That is my favorite Greek word, poema. You are his poetic expression of himself to this world. Do you hear that? I mean, we watched a video last week that talked about the the majesty of creation and how the stars, the planets, the galaxies proclaim the glory of God, but they pale in comparison to you. Of all that he's created, God says, you are my masterpiece. Like all of creation is glorious, but it does not compare to you. And it says we are his workmanship, his masterpiece, created in Christ Jesus under good works, which God hath before ordained. Listen, before eternity past was, God had already ordained what you would be doing with your life for his glory. Just let that sink in for a moment. Some of you are like, I have no idea what he wants me to do. So what do you think the answer is? A, do nothing. B, 
Find a friend. See. Pray to the one who before eternity passed ordained everything that you've been called to do. Or D, I'm still hung up on letter A. Do nothing. The answer is go to him. And, and it may be a trial and error. I heard Chip Ingram one time say, in reference to this one person, they said, Chip, I don't know what I'm supposed to do with my life. I, I don't know what my gifts are. And so you know what they did? They jumped into the kitchen, learned very quickly they can't cook. They went into the nursery ministry, found out very quickly they couldn't handle two-year-olds screaming and crying and changing diapers. They couldn't do that either. But you know what they found out they were good at? One guy found out he was really good at helping in the sound booth, found out he was very good at that. Another person found out they were very good at just talking to people as they came into the church. Listen, there is something for each of us to do. Why do I know that? Because God's word clearly says he's equipping you for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body. And I just can't think, what in the world could this body look like if 300 and some people said, hey, Pastor Scott, Pastor Doug Elders, put me in. Here I am, send me. Listen, this county isn't ready for what you'll be bringing. Literally what Christ will be bringing through you. So he says this, that we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained, that we should walk in them. That is what characterizes your life, that you should walk in them. How are we walking today? Better question is, where will you be walking today? What will you be doing with the allotment of time that God has given? Because no matter what it is that you're doing, it can be service to our king. He says that we should walk in them. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Paul says to the church in Corinth, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, oftentimes, frequently, when it's convenient to your schedule, if your friends are doing it. If I can afford it this week. Like, you're being facetious, just stop doing that. I guess I should stop doing that, huh? He says, always abounding in the work of the Lord. I shared with a funeral party yesterday at the graveside. It's incredible the depth of hurt we go through with the loss of a loved one. But it also equally reveals where we turn to for help. When you go through a trial, when you're going through a hardship, when you're going through a time of unknown, you'll find out very quickly where your hope resides. And I'm not being, I'm not being judgmental right now, but for some, it resides in a bottle. For some, it re resides in images on a screen. For some, it resides in a relationship outside the, outside the bonds of your marriage. For some, it resides in going to a local establishment surrounding yourself with people who will tell you what you want to hear. Well, my prayer is that for each of us in this room that that will look like turning to the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He says, abounding in the work of the Lord, always abounding in the work of the Lord. Why? For as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Listen, what you do for Christ's sake matters not only matters to him, it matters to the body and the bride of Christ. But there may be some of you sitting here today like, you know, Pastor Scott, I, I mean, I agree with what you're saying. And, and, and you know, I, I want to be used, but listen, I just can't be. You know, I'm not like, well, let me just say this. I've heard people say, I'm not like you and Pastor Doug. I can't talk to people. Yes, you can. I've seen you talk to people. I make you do it every Sunday before the morning message. Yeah, it's a trick, isn't it? Uh, it's a ploy. I've seen you do it, every one of you. Or maybe it's like, you know, but my, I just don't have the gifts other people have. We'll talk about that in a moment. But one of the things that we're gonna see is not only has God called for all hands to be on deck, but God sees the worth of every part of the body of Christ. He sees the worth of every part of the body of Christ. He cares if you're lagging behind. He cares if you're not using the gifts that he's given you. He cares if you think that no one else does, he does. And it says in verse 16, from whom the whole body, it's the whole body, it matters, fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplies. When we turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 
And, and really, this factors in that we could go so many different directions, but I promise we will wind this series down today, and I won't, I won't take any rabbit trails. I almost promise. But in 1 Corinthians 12, 12 to 26, the next time an unkind thing comes to the forefront of your mind about a member of the body of Christ, just slap it down for the trash that it is, please, and remind me to do the same. Because what I'm going to read to you is not just print on a page. This is the inspired word of God. And this, this is how seriously God thinks about our relationships together in the body of Christ. Listen, when we don't care and when it doesn't matter to us to a greater degree, I want you to understand it cares, he cares and it matters very much to Christ. And listen what the word of God says about the importance of each of you in this room today and what God thinks of you and your service to him. In verse 12, it says this, For as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of that one body, being many, are one body, so also is Christ. That's not hard for us to figure out. You've got a thumb, you've got fingers, you've got a wrist, you've got an elbow, you've got a knee, you've, you've got a stomach, some of us more than others. We do. We've got ribs. We got, if, you, if you're into the body, how many body parts? A lot. And we learned all the way down to laminin the protein cell adhesion molecule that's in the shape of a cross, always holding us together. There's many parts, but there is one body, it says, and so also is Christ. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been all made to drink into one spirit. There is one Holy Spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. There are many of us here. I don't know how many are here this morning. There are many members of this body. You're all over the place. Consequently, not in the front. I did notice that. There's a large gap that my, my body is really far from me. But there are many bodies. There, there, there's one body, but there are many parts. And then it goes on to say this. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body. Is it therefore not of the body? And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were an eye, where were the hearing? If the whole were hearing, where were the smelling? Like, there are some of you that are like, well, I can't do what other people are doing. And, and you know, maybe they're more forefront. Listen, it doesn't get more forefront than our nose. But listen, those hidden, those hidden parts, they're important. And if we were all a bunch of noses, we'd look really funny. That'd be a cool looking thing, wouldn't it? But we need our eyes. We need our hands, we need our feet, we need our ribs, we need our spine. Those things that you don't readily see, they're all important. It says, but now has God set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. As it's pleased who? God. As it's pleased him. Like somebody like, well, I can't do what they do. It's okay. God has specifically gifted you with that ability. He gave you that. How precious is that? As he looks down over all the people, yeah, maybe Pastor Scott has a really big mouth that can talk a lot and often with many words. You're like, I can't do that. But you are super gifted at doing this. Guess what? I probably can't. And we need that just as much as we need this. It says, as it has pleased him. And if, it says here, and if they were all one member, where were the body? But now are there many members, yet but one body. And the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you. Nor again the head to the feet, I have no need of you. No, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. Some of you are like, all I can do is pray. You should never say that. All I can do. Listen, I want you to know what that really means. All I can do, and how awesome is this, is bend the ear of the Most High. Yeah, that's a terrible thing, by the way. Listen. Those feeble parts that were, you're like, all I can do is be in a ministry of prayer and encouragement. Do you know how precious it is when a 90-some-year-old member of our church called me? Pastor Blair went on vacation for the very first time. He hadn't been away in a long time. I knew as soon as he left, something was going to happen. Lots of somethings happen. He leaves, and I got the flu. I'm laying upstairs sick as a dog, and I've got Wednesday night to figure out. Sunday morning, Sunday night, and somebody passed away. I'd never even done a funeral before. And at that point, I was hoping that they could do mine, that I could pass as well. I was like, how am I going to do this? And I'm laying upstairs sick as a dog because I thought maybe I'll get up and be inspired to actually work. So I'm laying upstairs, and my phone rings. And it's Alice Kaufman. If you remember Alice, 
in her 90s, physically wasn't able to do nearly as much as she used to. She said, Pastor Scott, I can't do a lot, but I can tell you I'm praying for you every day this week. And Kathy told me when I called, you weren't feeling good, and I just want you to know I'm going to be praying for you all day today. And immediately, as much as my stomach was still lifting, it lifted my spirits. What an encouragement to know that the other part of the body hurt when I was hurting and cared enough to call and say, hey, I'm praying for you, Scott. And that meant a lot. That meant a lot. And so it says, much more those members of the body which seem to be more feeble are necessary. And those members of the body which we think to be less honorable, upon these we bestow more abundant honor. And our uncomely parts have become more abundant, have more abundant comeliness. For our comely parts have no need. But God has tempered the body together, having given more abundant honor to the part which lacked. That there should be no schism, no divide in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. And whether one member suffer, all the members suffer with it, but we don't. And I say that to my own shame, but we don't. And if we could just be 100% transparent today, not only do we not suffer when the whole body suffers, we inflict the suffering in the body of Christ. And let's just call the spade a spade. That should never be. I understand myself and each of us in this room, we are imperfect, we are fallen, and we struggle mightily. But I want you to understand how very important every member is in this body, even the unruly, the unlovable, the unlikable, and the disobedient and insubordinate ones. I almost switched those words. They're all important. Or if one member is honored, listen to this, not jealousy, not sabotage, all members rejoice with it. How cool would that be if when one member of the body was down, we wretched down 320 some strong and we picked them back up? How cool would that be when one of us is unruly and it happens? You get, listen, if you have a family of four, you see it with two children, let alone 323 sheep. If one of us got out of line, the other 322 were willing to just stop and lift them back up. What if when somebody had this outstanding blessing, rather than get jealous, and, and, and we do that, and I'm not gonna argue with this this morning, we don't, we do. And instead, we were like just stopped and we rejoiced with them. Do you know how radically different we would look from the rest of the world around us? We'd look like Christ. <laughs> Wouldn't that be super cool? And it says, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. Listen, one of the things is I read that this week. At no point, how many points? At no point, listen, this is just truth. Can I ever say that I don't need any part of my body? Because God's word says, listen, the eye can't say I don't need the foot. The foot can't say I don't need the eye. The knee can't say I don't need the elbow. Listen, if you're in the body of Christ, I need you. Can I say that again? If you're in the body of Christ, this local body, I need you. And truthfully, in the universal body of Christ, I need you as well. Because the Bible says there's one body with many parts and I need every part. How many of you are willing to give up your right elbow today? You're like, that's silly. No. How many of you are willing to lose your right foot? Or maybe we'll just pull the heart out of your chest. What happens when you lose one part of the body? The rest of it suffers. I need each and every one of you. We need each other. There's no part of the body that's then unimportant. Each and every part down to the smallest cell is essential. And one of the things that I also picked up on is while some parts get more attention and they seem more significant, maybe like, well, our pastors are more important. Or maybe our elders or, or the youth leaders who just took our 20, 20 some people down to North Carolina, they're more important. No, let me tell you, the person who stands there and welcomes these people coming in the door is important. And when I hear from the outside community how friendly and how loving that church is, as soon as you walk through the door, that's because of you. I'm not standing there. And when I hear about the blessing that the senior meal, guess what? I don't lift one spatula. I don't turn on one burner. I don't cook one morsel of the food that they eat at that senior meal. You do. 
And when that person who lost that loved one receives 25 cards, guess what? I didn't send 24 other ones with the one I sent. You did. There's not one member of this body in here this morning that's unimportant. And as the word of God stands, there's not one of you that we should really be trying to live without. And may God help us with that. Back to our racetrack story. Lap 10. The 20S is stretching the lead. That motor sounds sharp. Actually, the other race cars, I'm going to make an idiot of myself doing that. Wow, 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 wow. I mean, they're just screaming around the track. Smoke flying, the 20S. Wow, wow, wow. That thing is hooked to the track. It, that, the rubber is hitting the surface, and he is flying. And all of a sudden, I see the caution. And then I see Scotty Haas. I'm like, oh, no. No, this is our chance. What happened? And I see the 20S coast to a stop. And then I see the blasted tow truck hooking to the back of the car, pulling it into the pit stall. And everyone's just devastated. Like, we, we were going to win that race. Not a question. Pending that. The motor didn't let go. You think, well, the motor's the most important thing of that race car. Maybe it's the fuel. Nah, the fuel was still there. Maybe it's the inline transmission. Nah, that thing was still there. All four tires were still inflated. The driver still had his, his gas pedal, he, and he still had his right foot to slam it to the floor. All of that was still there. Do you know what failed? One small electric connector to the starter. We lost one small connector from the ground wire to the starter, and that race car with its 500, 600 horsepower came to a screeching halt, dead as a doornail. Can you believe that the biggest race of his career to that point that he could have won lost because of a part about the size of the eraser and the end of this pencil? Do you think that every part matters? Shake your head yes. And if it matters that much in a race that only those like me who hang on to those things for like 15 years, listen, I can tell you most of the fans that day will never remember that the 20S almost won its first race. They'll never remember that a limited late model was out pulling the super lates for 10 laps. But you know what? I will never forget the importance of one part. And if it matters that much on a race car, how much more does it matter in this church, this body right here, right now today? And so the last thing I want to share with you as we, as we wrap up, not only has God called all hands to be on deck, not only does God see every part of the body of Christ, but if you're here thinking, no, nope, I mean, every part but me, I, I don't have anything. I've got nothing to offer. I just want to share with you that God has graciously gifted every part of the body of Christ. You sit here today gifted and endowed. It may be undeveloped. It may be potential that's untapped, but God has gifted you for the work of the ministry, for the building up of the body of Christ, that you can be a part of what God's doing here in Heston. Verse 16, it says, from whom the whole body being fitted and held together, it is compacted together by what every joint supplies according to the proper working of each individual part. Each and every one of you working together as God has called you to holds this church together and it causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. And so each and every one of us have a part to play in God's building of the church. Just because this series closed, our job doesn't. Just because we're going to maybe move on to Galatians doesn't mean that we stop in our pursuit of God using us to build his church. We all have a part to play. Well, here's a question. So how can I know that God has gifted me for ministry? How can I know that? I'm glad you asked. And even if you didn't ask and you weren't wondering, I'm going to tell you that Romans 12, 3 to 8 says this. For through the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think. Number one, there are some of us in here that are very gifted. You know it and you flaunt it. And what Paul says is you live in a right relationship toward God and the rest of the body. Don't do that. It's, un, it's distasteful. It's unseemly. And the word of God says it's inappropriate. He says, so for through the grace, as God has given me his unmerited favor, I'm sharing that with you, is that if you think more highly of yourself than you ought to think today, don't. But to think so is to have sound judgment. Listen, here's why. Because God has allotted to each a measure of faith. That is not in reference to salva salvation faith. That's in reference to the gift that God has given each of you as a part of this body, is the sense of this word in the Greek. 
For just as we have many members in one body, and all members do not have the same function, so we who are many are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Let that sink in. Listen, when somebody messes with your son or daughter, what rises up within you as a parent? Like, yeah, you know. Like, bring it. Ready to break out whooping sticks and stuff. I understand. What if you saw your, listen, look around this building. Seriously, don't stare at me. That doesn't mean look, look around this building. And what if we truly believed that that young lady right in front of me or this, this guy in front of me, he's always harassing me about my cowboys. What if I believed that I really couldn't live without him? And what if you really believe that person to your left, you know, I really can't live without them. What if that guy behind you, maybe he's sleeping through the service, he's been disrupting you with snoring right now. What if you were to say like that guy? Yeah, I need him. Or maybe it's the people on Facebook right now. You think I don't know, but I do. There are cameras in this place. Just kidding. <laughs> Even though you may think what we're saying is not important, I need you too. I need you. And what if we really believed that each one of us made a difference? and we're important to what Christ is doing. The word of God says that we do, and we're members of one another. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. Listen, what that means is that some of you are really good at at cooking. What if the people in the kitchen just stopped cooking and you left it up to those of us that don't cook? Wouldn't that be an interesting thing for those 140 seniors? They come and they're expecting like stuffed chicken breasts and they get ramen noodles because that's the best thing that I could put together. <laughs> or, you know, what, what if we get to the bead ministry and there's not one person there to share the gospel? All we have is three people out front. Hey, can I offer you a walking stick today? And there's not one person sitting in that chair. Now, that's not the guilt you into being in the bead ministry. I'm saying that every ministry, every part in this church matters. And so just because your gift may not be the most out front, don't think it's any less important. Listen, you might think your big toe. Try losing your big toe and then go and trying to run. Even though it's hidden, even though it's not out front, you need your big toe. Or maybe that, you know, you would think, oh, my lungs, you know, I don't see them. Try living without your lungs. Every part, no matter how hidden or insignificant you think it is, is important. So what does the Word of God say for each of us and how we use our gifts? And let me go back to the scripture here. Our, it says here, now you are the body of Christ and members in particular. And God, now I'm in the wrong. So why didn't you guys tell me I was back into 1 Corinthians? Romans 12. It says, verse 7. It says here, or verse 6. Since we have gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, each of us is to exercise them accordingly. If prophecy, according to the proportion of his faith. If service in his serving. Or he who teaches in his teaching. Listen, there are some of you who are so gifted. Like, like being able to take the word of God and paint this picture for all of us to understand. You've got that gift and you've been hiding it under a bushel. Stop hiding it. Let one of us know. Like, listen, you know what? I know that I'm really good at teaching. Is there anywhere I could be used? I assure you, we will get you plugged in. And so he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, exhortation, he who gives with liberality, and he who leads with diligence, and he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. As we wrap up, in other words, God has sovereignly gifted each and every one of us with the ability to serve as a part of this body. And really what it boils down to is will we choose to use the gifts that God has given us? Because one of three things this morning. There maybe it's an inexhaustible list, but I'm going to give you three. We'll walk out of here unmoved by anything what God's word has said today. Two, we'll walk out of here and we'll maybe give it some thought, but we'll allow the old thoughts about, nah, someone else will do it. I'm not good enough. How could God use me? And we'll slip back into the, the, the shadows. Or three, we're going to walk out of here. We're going to go to prayer and say, you know what, God, just as Isaiah said, and what a ministry Isaiah had. Look at Jeremiah as he had to minister to a people that no one responded to. We'll find ourselves saying, you know what, God, here I am, send me. And if you're here today and you don't know what your gifts are, talk to one of the leaders. 
Or I'll encourage you to do this. When there is a sign-up, you will find out quickly what your gifts are and what they're not. If you sign up for the senior luncheon and you can't stand food, then don't do it. You go into the nursery and like the smell of poop makes you throw up, then don't work in the nursery. But you might find, listen, I really like talking to people. Or I, I'm really good at like maintaining vehicles. We have two of them. We'd love to give you an opportunity to do that. Or you know what? I love going and visiting people. I like cooking meals and going, guess what? The, the, the more people we have, the more needs we become aware of. And we need people to minister to them. So it could be by trial and error. But I'll tell you the greatest way you can do it is to go home and pray. Because the word of God says he has created you under good works, which he has before ordained. He already knows what they are. The question is, are we willing to do them as God continues to build his church through us. Let us pray. Father, we come to you and we thank you for the precious word of God. And I thank you for so much. Lord, the truth is as much as we've spent in this Build the Church series and these five verses, we've been all over the blueprint of the word of God. And we still haven't scratched the surface of what you're, you're doing in us and calling us to. And yet I thank you, Lord, for the, the opportunities we've had to, to look at the, the, the leadership you've given to look at the plan and the purposes that you've established, to, to, to look at the pathway you set for us to follow and, and the reasoning for why you've done that. And Lord, each one in this room is an important cog, an important process. We said about the ministry of multiplication in 2 Timothy 2, each one of us are a factor in your equation. And you are calling us to use the gifts, to develop the gifts, and really you'll develop them through us as we use them. So that Lord, the body can be built up and the lost can be found discipleship and evangelism, the two purposes of the church today. And Father, I pray that if there's one in here today who's ever wondered what their gifts are, that they would wonder no more, but would come to you in prayer. Will come talk to one of us or simply would just start getting plugged in and they will find out very quickly the gifts that you've given them. Lord, I pray that as we leave this room today, and even though we wind this series down, we've talked a lot about speaking the truth in love. We've talked about needing every part of the body of Christ. Lord, we struggle in the flesh in the way that we treat each other. That's just a fact. And we're not gonna hide from that. We're not gonna tap dance around it. The truth is we struggle as mankind with being loving toward one another. And it makes sense to me that the enemy would, would hit that area in our lives because the truth is it says that by our love for one another will all men know that we're your disciples. And so what a greater way to shield the world from the love of God as extended through Christ than to see the church veil their love for each other. But Lord God, we're asking you to help us to strip that veil away. Help us to see each other the way you see us. Lord, we're getting ready to sing about the power of the cross. And we're going to sing about a Savior who, even though he's in the garden sweating, as it were, drops of blood, saying, if it be possible, this cup should pass. He said, nevertheless, not my will, but thine be done, and was willing to drink the full cup of God's wrath in our place, that we could be ransomed, that we could be forgiven, that we could be set free and brought into a right relationship with Christ that we could have never have formed ourselves. And you did that for the very ones who cried out, crucify him. Oh God, as we look to you as our example, give us the strength to follow the example you set. Make yourself known through the community chapel of Heston, not for our name's sake, but for yours. And keep building us up as you continue to build your church in Jesus' name. Amen.